Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today on affirming gender identity in clinical practice. Megan Graham will be discussing the distinction between sex and gender and a better understanding of the range of gender identities that exist. Additionally, she'll review strategies for providing an open and affirming stance for clients and families to talk about their gender identity and to help clients to advocate for their needs. I'll be turning things over to her shortly, but first I'd like to review a few housekeeping items with you all. Please remember to mute your computer speakers if you're calling in via phone. The computer speakers can be muted through Adobe Connect by pressing on the green horn above the presenter's pod. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later today on the MHTTC website. The PowerPoint slides and any additional resources discussed today will also be available. During the presentation, if you have any technical difficulties or questions about the topic, you can use the chat and questions box down on the bottom left. Those attending today's live event will be eligible to request a certificate. More information regarding CEUs will be in a post-webinar follow-up email. And to reach us after the webinar, you can email newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. Our MHTTC's mission is to use evidence-based means to disseminate evidence-based practices across New England. Our area of focus is geared towards recovery through recovery-oriented practices and support services within the context of recovery-oriented systems of care. To ensure the responsiveness of our work, we will actively develop and maintain a network composed of different stakeholders from each of the six states to guide our activities. To learn more about us, you can visit our website as well. And with that, it is my pleasure to announce our speaker today, Megan Graham. Hi, everyone. Let me just get my webcam started. Um, OK, so I think that we should be in business. Um, so as Rachel has so kindly introduced, uh, my name is Megan Graham. I'm a licensed mental health clinician. I currently work for the Cedar Clinic and Research Program in Boston. Um, I have quite a bit of background additionally working with the LGBT population in both group home and uh, outpatient group settings, um, have been working with that population uh, for about 10 plus years now, most recently was working with a group, a middle school group in the Metro West region. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today a bit about different gender identities and affirming gender identity in clinical practice. I have no relevant disclosures. Um, so, the first thing that I want to discuss is the fact that um, sex and gender are not the same. Um, though the terms are often used interchangeably for the purposes of today especially, and uh, just conceptually speaking, it's important to understand the differences between them. So when we discuss sex, we're talking about a person's physical traits, things like genitalia, chromosomes, hormones, secondary sex characteristics. Etc. Um, a person's sex is generally assigned at birth, um, usually by a, a viewing of genitalia when a person is born. Gender, however, uh, is a person's internal mental, emotional, spiritual relationship to their identity on the gender spectrum. Um, that's often the spectrum, excuse me, is often uh, talked about in relation to both masculinity and femininity as uh, existing on opposite sides of that spectrum. Um, in a lot of people, a person's sex and gender match up. Um, when that is the case for an individual, we say that they are what is called cisgender. So in cisgender individual sex, uh, the physical sex of the body and a person's gender identity are in alignment. Um, however, that's not always the case. So there are a lot of different ways that we can see that manifested. Uh, in individuals who are assigned female at birth and actually identify as male, uh, people who are assigned male at birth and identify as female, individuals that we would uh, call transgender, or people who are assigned male or female at birth and either don't identify with any gender or who identify with a combination of genders. And we'll talk a little bit more about each of those and what those mean. Um, those identities often fall uh, in what we call, oh, excuse me, 
um, outside of the binary. So when we talk about binary, we're talking about uh, two things. So relating to or composed of two things. The gender binary is a system that recognizes two genders, male and female, and often classifies them as both distinct and dichotomous from each other. Um, within the gender binary, both sex and gender are generally seen as synonymous. That's particularly significant because it has an impact significantly on the way that society perceives individuals and the expectations that are placed on them based simply on uh, their anatomy and the sex that they were assigned at birth. Existing outside of that spectrum, however, that binary, excuse me, um, we talk about the gender non-binary. So the gender non-binary is an umbrella term for any gender identity that is not exclusively male or female. Now, that can include a lot of different kinds of identity. So sometimes we refer to individuals who are non-binary as gender non-conforming, gender queer, gender fluid, a whole list of terms here. Um, these identities are not all the same, though they all do refer to non-binary identities. So for example, um, gender queer and gender fluid individuals uh, often identify with both genders, male and female, and often move across the spectrum kind of between those two. Individuals who are agender often do not identify as having any gender, so they are neither, uh, whereas gender neutral and androgen folks often identify um, with uh, <coughs> excuse me, they identify with either, not, neither binary uh, gender and exist kind of somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. So not either male or female, again, kind of in the middle of those two. Um, important to realize that non-binary identities are often classified under the umbrella of uh, trans, uh, transgender folks. But non-binary people often consider themselves to exist outside that binary as well. So uh, we often look at being cisgender and transgender as a binary of its own, and non-binary individuals feel that they don't actually exist in that umbrella, under that umbrella either. Um, any questions on any of that so far? I'm happy to answer kind of as we go along. So let's talk a little bit um, about how, I, I, excuse me, how gender develops. So gender identity is thought to be a development of um, an interplay of biologic, environmental, and different cultural factors. Um, the biologic underpinnings of that can include things like the endocrine system, the genetic, and neuroanatomical systems. Um, really important to note that gender identity similar to sexual orientation is understood to largely not be a choice. Um, research has substantiated that children who are pre-puberty and assert themselves as being uh, transgender or gender non-conforming are aware of their gender sort of as clearly and consistently as developmentally equivalent peers who are identifying as cisgender. So we often think about waiting until after a young person has uh, approached puberty to sort of see if um, their gender expansive identity is going to be a phase. Um, research has shown that this is actually not the best method to take, um, and gender and affirmation is really the more kind of current understanding of the best way in which to support a child's gender identity and mental health related to that identity. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics believes that most kids have a pretty stable sense of their gender identity by age four, though they may not have the words or the capacity to either express or label their identity or to present in ways that are conflicting with the familial, societal, kind of cultural expectations of their gender that have been placed on them um, kind of existing within the, um, the gender binary. Um, so as I had said, while the American Academy of Pediatrics feels that kids have a stable sense of gender by age four, um, research also shows that kids often start to realize the disconnect, the incongruence between their sex and their gender sort of more um, as a concrete concept by about age eight and a half. So also pretty early in life, but again by age eight and a half is when they're starting to be able to conceptualize and label that in a more specific way. Um, okay, so as we had discussed,
discussed. Sex is uh, identified by biological markers, so a person's genes, hormones, genitalia, secondary sex characteristics, et cetera. In a lot of people, again, those, always, those align, but similarly with gender identity, not always the case. So in intersex individuals, markers of sex do not match or overlap, or they overlap in some way. So that can mean that the person's genetic makeup does not match their secondary sex characteristics. That can mean that their hormones are not in line with genitalia. That can also mean that they can present with something uh, like a mix of different kind of hormone profiles or genitalia that is visu visually ambiguous. Um, it is impossible to determine whether an individual is intersex by appearance uh, for a few reasons. One, we're not able to see the inner workings of a person's genetics and hormones. Also, genes evolve. So we could do a complete genetic profile of an individual at age 10, uh, and that same individual's profile by age 35 would not necessarily match up. Um, intersex differences are present um, more often than people are uh, often aware of. So um, we actually look at um, incidents as being higher than um, incidents of having red hair. So just to kind of give some comparison there, there are more intersex individuals existing in the world than individuals who are redheads. So about 1.7% of the population presents with some sort of an intersex uh, presentation. So again, whether that be genitalia, secondary sex characteristics that don't match up. Um, so, um, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, a nice visual that we often use working with young people in terms of understanding differences between gender identity, gender expression, etc. So the gender elephant um, is what is on the screen in front of you now. And you can see the ways in which these things present kind of in the whole person. So gender identity is a person's internal, again, relationship with their gender masculinity, femininity. And that can be seen kind of across um, their entire being. Gender expression is the way that a person presents their relationship with their gender. So that can be things like the way that a person dresses, whether they wear nail polish, um, the way that their hair cut. So that um, we also see in the entire person. Uh, when we look at sex, we're looking at uh, sex assigned at birth, and again, a person's genitalia, uh, sex characteristics, hormones, genetic makeup, et cetera. Um, we used to consider sex also to exist on a binary, and our kind of increasing understanding of intersex identities also shows us that that is a spectrum. So you can see that that is uh, depicted in kind of the, the triangle that is uh, under the sex assigned at birth category. Uh, physically attracted to, again, that is um, sexual orientation and the way that a person kind of it interacts with other people in terms of who they are sexually, emotionally, physically attracted to. Um, Non-binary gender identities also expand the way that we think about and label um, orientation. So let me go back a bit here. So we previously um, often heard terms like heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual. But as we have increased our understanding of different gender identities, uh, the way that we talk about sexual orientation has also needed to expand to incorporate those different gender identities. So we now understand um, that a person might be attracted to, for example, individuals that are cisgender male and also trans men, um, or specifically attracted to people who do not identify as being on the gender binary. So individuals who are scoliosexual, for example, specifically are attracted to folks who identify as either trans or gender nonconforming, gender non-binary. So um, I always like to mention here that the kind of language around gender identity and sexual orientations is ever expanding and ever shifting. Um, this is something that I hear from a lot of providers and families uh, as an area that they feel inadequate and sort of have difficulty keeping up on. Um, it's always important to be respectful with language, certainly, 
but I often encourage folks to cut themselves some slack here. Um, you can always Google things, and young people are generally pretty open to sharing aspects of their identity and the language uh, that they are adopting in order to better express that identity. Um, okay, uh, any questions about any of those things conceptually at this point, any cases that you have worked with before we move on to talking more about some clinical considerations? So it doesn't look like there are questions at this point. So I wanted to go into a greater detail now about some of the ways that these things can manifest uh, in terms of your clinical work with children, uh, young people, and families. So, excuse me, um, really important to think about the ways that identifying as non-binary, gender non-conforming, or transgender can impact a young person's mental health. There are a lot of data that have consistently shown us that trans and gender non-conforming youth are at significantly higher risk of incidents of depression, anxiety, and suicide and self-harm. Um, the U.S. Transgender Survey conducted in 2015 found that the rate of attempted suicide among transgender respondents was approximately nine times higher than that of the general population. So uh, really significantly higher than cisgender adolescents um, of the same age. The gender, excuse me, the transgender adolescent suicide behavior um, study was done Oh, I'm um, sorry, there was a question that came in. Yes, slides will be able to be accessed after the webinar. Um, so the, that was, uh, excuse me, let me start, start that over. The Journal of American Academy of Pediatrics published an article that was written on the transgender adolescent um, suicide behavior scale that was conducted in an attitude and behavior survey. That survey was given to over 120,000 adolescents ages 11 to 19. Uh, they were, data were collected over a 36-month period from 2012 to 2015. And though we have for some time known that rates of suicide and self-harm were significantly higher in trans youth, this study specifically started to flesh that out a bit further in terms of differences between identities and um, how that can look for youth that are identifying in different ways. So what I mean by that, uh, the highest rate of attempted suicide, and let me just kind of uh, note here, this is actual rate of attempted suicide, not simply suicidal ideation. Um, the highest rate of attempted suicide in adolescents was reported among female to male adolescents specifically. Uh, over 50% of female to male adolescents have attempted, had attempted suicide at some point in their life at the time that this survey was conducted. Um, youth who were identifying as not exclusively male or female, so somewhere on the gender non-conforming, gender non-binary spectrum, had the second highest rate of attempted suicide at 42%. Um, and male to female adolescents reported rates of about 29.9%. Um, let me just compare that also to the rates reported by cisgender adolescents. So female adolescents who are cisgender had reported attempted suicide rates of about 17.5%, with male adolescents at about 9.8%. So again, just to compare that to female to male adolescents who had attempted suicide at a rate of 50.8%. Um, important to note here, there's no evidence that a risk for mental illness is, can be inherently attributed to a person's identity as being trans or non-binary. Um, it's believed to be multifactorial and stemming from a person's conflict between appearance and identity, so the rate to which a person may experience gender dysphoria, um, their availability of mental health services, low access to health care providers who may have experience in caring for youth who identify as trans and non-binary, social rejection, rejection excuse me, um, the rate to which their family is gender affirming and engaging in actively gender affirming behaviors. 
in addition to increased incidence of suicide and uh, mental health uh, symptoms like depression and anxiety, we also see much higher rates of substance use, um, STDs, in this population that can often be related to the mental health symptoms that they're experiencing, as well as increased incidence of engaging in risky sexual behaviors as they are working to uh, both confirm their own identities and also to find their, their way sort of with peers and in dating relationships. Um, we often see youth in this population experience increased rates of dating violence, often due to feeling like they will not be accepted by other partners and need to stay with partners who may be engaging in verbally or physically abusive behaviors. Um, eating disorders also Something that we see quite a bit in this population, again, often related to other mental health symptoms and disorders that they also may be uh, experiencing. Uh, also, some youth will engage in eating disordered behavior in order to help um, present in the gender that they uh, are identifying with. So, for example, we may see female to male adolescents who engage in restrictive eating behaviors in order to keep their bodies small and avoid uh, developing what are traditionally female uh, characteristics like larger hips, breasts, et cetera. Um, someone had just said that there are also increased rates of sexual abuse and assault in this population. Absolutely. Thank you for noting that. So in addition, it's really important when working with this population to spend a lot of time reflecting on your personal bias and also your knowledge in this area. Um, so it's important to, to reflect on whether or not this is something that you see as inherently pathological. Is a, a gender non-conforming, gender expansive identity something that you're likely to view as a phase or something that has become trendy, um, something, again, that you are going to see as being a characterological flaw uh, or just a <laughs> excuse me, the presence of pathology in an individual. Important to note, uh, individuals who identify as trans and non-binary do not automatically have gender dysphoria. So gender dysphoria is specifically related to the degree to which incongruence between a person's sex and gender are causing distress or impairment. So if a person feels like, um, you know, they are having a lot of difficulty dealing with their physical body, um, if they are having internal feelings of stigma and shame, it's important to examine that with clients and whether the dysphoria that they may be experiencing is about their actual internal feelings and perception of self or if it's related to systems that are existing around them. So are people being ostracized at school, having difficulty with families, uh, finding employment, things like that? Um, really important also to think about language, uh, making sure that the language that you are using is gender affirming uh, in terms of using the, the words that a person, um, the pronouns that they have chosen, their chosen name. Um, also though, being thoughtful about not using what we call uh, cis-normative language. So some people have probably heard the word heteronormative, which is kind of existing in a way that reflects a belief that heterosexuality is the standard and anything outside of that is different or atypical. So the same can happen with language that we use around gender. So are we using language that is affirming gender expansive identities or language that is reflective of the gender binary and a feeling that being cisgender is the norm and any identity outside of that is atypical. So that can be really important not only in the language that you're using when you are talking to clients and processing in therapy with them, but also things like paperwork and forms. So what are, when clients come in and they're filling out intake paperwork, um, what kind of identities are reflected there? Are they forced to choose between male and female check boxes? Um, are they able to fill in an identity? Do you, does your paperwork actually have different non-binary or trans identities reflected right in there? Um, so the National Transgender Discrimination Survey 
found that significant um, incidents, a significant incidence, excuse me, of trans and non-binary folks who had experienced significant difficulty accessing care, both in terms of physical and mental health. So you can see here, 50% uh, of folks reported having to educate providers, whether that was about uh, the language that they use, whether it is um, about different difficulties that they face as gender uh, expansive individuals, um, or just you know identifying terms, things like that. 19% um, of folks reported having been refused care in the past, just flat out refused care by medical and mental health providers. Um, unsurprisingly, this has resulted in pretty significant percentages of folks who are either postponing seeking care or have delayed seeking care altogether. So the U.S. Transgender Survey uh, that was done in 2015 that I had mentioned found that 23% of individuals who filled out the survey had not sought needed medical or mental health care at all in the last year due to concerns specifically that they would be mistreated by providers, often due to a history of mistreatment by providers. Um, other clinical considerations include considering the intersection of a person's gender identity with other aspects of their, of their identity, excuse me. So what's actually most clinically pressing for an individual? We can often assume um, that that is related to their gender identity, but may not actually be the case. So not assuming that someone who presents as trans or non-binary is there to work on the fact that they are trans or non-binary um, can be really important also to talk about um, the person's privilege and the way that privilege impacts um, their identity and the way that that might shift for them. So for example, uh, someone who was born male at birth and who has been existing in a system that has afforded them privilege based on their male identity, who transitions and begins to present as female um, is going to experience a shift in privilege and the way that they are perceived and interacted with by other people. That can be something that uh, folks don't necessarily think of before they pursue uh, gender congruence measures, so it can be really important to discuss with them. I wanted to talk also about a couple of those terms that I actually just used. So when we talk about a person's identity, um, we're again talking about kind of their internal relationship. We can then also start to talk about the way that they're going to express that identity in an outward way. So what is the person's, again, kind of dress, uh, relationship, all of those different aspects of identity. What are those things going to look like and how are they going to change? Some individuals will choose not to undergo um, kind of any actual outward transitional steps. Um, that is a little bit more rare, but certainly does happen and something that can warrant quite a bit of processing in sessions. Um, the word that I had used earlier, transition, there is an implication when we say transition or that a person is transitioning that in some way they are changing or they're becoming someone or something else than what, the, what they have been. Um, better terms actually to use are things like gender affirmation, gender affirming steps, or saying that a person is pursuing gender congruence measures. Now, those uh, kind of manifest in a lot of different ways. Those can include um, social congruence measures, hormonal, surgical, legal. So um, social, again, in terms of gender expression. How is a person interacting with others? How is their understanding of the way that their outward expression of gender is impacting their relationships and the way that they present to the world. Um, hormonal, surgical, those are fairly self-explanatory, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about hormones in just a few minutes. Legal congruence measures can include things like getting new identification cards, legally changing one's name, one's birth certificate, etc. Now, all of these gender congruence measures are not likely to happen simultaneously. Um, people are often ready to pursue different pieces of them at different times. And these things can also uh, result in or can cause varying levels of struggle for individuals that can uh, also warrant quite a bit of need for clinical support. 
So for example, uh, I worked with a client who was comfortable and ready to begin pursuing uh, hormone congruence measures, so started taking uh, cross-sex hormones, but was still really struggling with social congruence measures and how to dress, how to interact with individuals, what name and pronouns to use. And that caused quite a bit of inner kind of turmoil for this person. It was really anxiety provoking, whereas pursuing hormonal congruence measures was not as anxiety provoking and just felt like a step that was affirming the person's uh, true self. Um, so just a couple other there at the bottom. Um, you can see also religion and lifespan development and fluidity. So the way that a person chains, oh, changes over the course of their development, their understanding of gender, uh, how they want to express their gender, sort of their understanding of where they fit uh, in a system of religion, if that's something that's important to them, in terms of both whether they are accepted or ostracized by their religious community, as well as how does understanding and expressing their gender expansive identity fit in with their own framework of religion and sin, what's right and what is wrong. So I wanted to quickly show excuse me, this chart. Um, I had spoken earlier about language, but it, which also includes um, pronouns. Um, so you can see here at the top, gender, non, gender binary pronouns, excuse me, are pronouns that we are all pretty familiar with, she, her, hers, he, him, his. At the bottom there are some gender neutral pronouns. So they, them, theirs used in the singular, which a lot of people express difficulty with, um, feeling like it just doesn't feel grammatically correct, can take a little bit of practice. Others here are Z here and here's and uh, different variations on those. Those do tend to be uh, used less than they, them, there in the singular. But there is a little kind of cheat sheet of uh, gender neutral pronouns. Okay, um, so other clinical considerations, certainly families. One of the first things uh, when working with trans and non-binary clients is to get a sense from them of what their families already know and what the client is comfortable with. So some clients are out in social settings. They may be out in therapy in terms of uh, having told others what their gender expansive identity is, but their families may not know yet. Um, families also may know that uh, a youth is identifying on the gender expansive spectrum, for example, but not know that the youth uh, has chosen different pronouns or is going by a chosen name in other settings. So again, important to check in about what uh, a client's family actually knows. Talking with families about respecting names and pronouns can be a really important one. Uh, parents often express quite a bit of difficulty with this and will say things like, oh, well, you know, I've known him as my son at, by this particular name for so many years now. How am I supposed to just start calling him something else? So you know, talking with families about practicing that um, being respectful of names and pronouns, but then also working with young people around the fact that families are likely going to need a little bit of time to adjust to some of these things. Um, but that can also be continuously difficult and hurtful for a person who's feeling like they are being misgendered. Um, so in addition to more nuclear family units, really important to, to look at the larger family system also. Um, so where does the extended family fit in? Um, are youth out to their extended families? I see often a lot of difficulties in families with parents who, for example, will say that they're comfortable with a youth, youth identity, but there's no way that they could expect the grandparents to get on board. Or, um, you know, there's a great aunt who will just think that this is wrong. And so we'll ask children to not uh, express themselves, their, their true gender identity at family functions, things like that. So working on that within the family system can be really, really important. Um, talking with parents about what their comfort is around a youth's expression of their gender identity both in and out of the home 
working on kind of navigating how youth will present in school uh, and families kind of balancing act of protecting a youth and also affirming um, their gender identity and their ability to express themselves according to their gender identity. So role shifts um, can also be something that takes quite a bit of processing and kind of time to adjust to. So as I had mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll hear things from parents that say, you know, I've, this is my son, how can I start calling him by a different name? Um, also parents sometimes will feel like they don't know how to interact with a child. Um, you know, the relationship with a daughter is different than a relationship with a son in a lot of families' kind of perception of gender and, you know, and parental roles. So working with them around that, uh, excuse me, as well as the fact that in a lot of situations, children will take on role of educator to some extent. So making sure that parents are able to feel supported and like they have enough education and that youth are able to express themselves and their gender identities to parents without feeling like they are taking on the role constantly of having to help parents kind of through that process. Parents often have to learn to advocate for them, their children and their families in a different, uh, often more vocal way than many have been used to in the past. So kind of what does the role of parent as advocate look like? Uh, grief and loss. So this can be a difficult one and often should be done um, separate from work that is done when, within the larger family system, but parents um, sometimes feel like, again, they, they have lost their child in some ways or they have lost their ideas about what their relationships with their kids and you know, what their children's futures will look like. Parenthood, certainly. So uh, here I mean, what is parenthood going to look like for clients? Um, if clients want to become parents, how will they relate to kids in terms of their gender presentation? So how are they feeling about being a non-binary parent? What does that look like? How does the family navigate gendered words like mom and dad? How do they move kind of outside the binary in some of those ways? Um, also here, issues of infertility often come up. So, uh, excuse me, patients who um, have undergone hormone therapy, whether that is hormone blockers or cross-sex hormones, often experiences experience issues related to infertility. So uh, if people are not able to become biological parents, um, that can also be something, you know, that people experience some issues of grief and loss around and need help navigating in terms of expanding kind of their, their conceptualization of what parenthood might look like for them uh, and what the, the kind of the family system will look like. Uh, schools. So large percentages of uh, youth experience discrimination and harassment in schools. Uh, National Transgender Survey found that over 55% of trans and gender nonconforming youth in grades K through 12 had experienced verbal harassment, over 22 had experienced physical harassment, uh, and over 11% had actually been physically assaulted in schools. So significant incidents of being bullied across spectrums in these youth. Um, so dealing with uh, a child's ability to advocate for themselves, to access safe gender affirming spaces, uh, this can often really present in things like locker rooms and bathrooms. Um, you know, children who are on sports teams or um, in classrooms where kids are often divided by sex. So, you know, boys and girls doing different activities or on different teams. Um, also see a lot of issues with completion of school here. So about 15% of trans and gender nonconforming adults surveyed had reported having left school early due to being harassed, which certainly can have an impact on individuals uh, for throughout the course of their life. Um, one that I didn't mention also uh, in terms of families are housing and resource stability. So often um, youth are concerned about whether they're going to be kicked out of their homes if they come out as trans or gender nonconforming. Will parents stop paying for college? Things like that. So again, helping them to navigate that both personally, what plans will be if those things were to happen, and then discussing those different uh, kind of realities within the family system. Um, so just a few more to discuss here. Um, economic disparities. So 
trans and gender non-conforming folks are four times more likely to have a household income of less than $10,000. That can be for a lot of different reasons, sometimes related to um, school incompletion, sometimes related to difficulty with employment. So individuals who find that they experience significant discrimination or harassment within the workplace. Um, gender identity is not something that is cons consistently um, protected in terms of employment. So individuals in a lot of states across the country can indeed be fired for uh, being trans or gender non-conforming. Um, the lack of continuity of employment is also something that can be often related to economic disparities in this population. So individuals who have a significant work history and then pursue gender congruence measures, so perhaps change their name, begin presenting um, as is in line with their gender identity, who then feel like they have gaps on a resume, either because they took time off while they were pursuing gender congruence measures or because they are no longer wanting to account for employment that they may have held while they were identifying um, by their birth name um, or the sex, their sex assigned at birth. So I wanted to talk just a little bit. Um, the criminal justice system, medical care, um, we talked a little bit about medical care already and the significant incidence of folks who report either being refused care or delaying access to care. Um, the criminal justice system can, is one that often comes up um, because of economic disparities um, and individuals engaging in illegal behaviors, um, whether that's related to drug use, uh, related to resource security. Um, also, if individuals are arrested or incarcerated for any of those things, um, you know, what population they are assigned to, whether they are housed with individuals that uh, are in line with their sex assigned at birth or whether they are allowed to be housed with individuals um, that are aligned with their actual gender identity. Um, so gender affirming hormones uh, is the last thing I wanted to discuss today. This is something that comes up quite a bit, especially in work with adolescents and uh, younger children. So hormones, I've mentioned uh, these terms already, but or we talk about kind of two different sets of hormones. So one is hormone blockers, which are hormones that are given to uh, prepubescent youth in order to delay or entirely stop the onset of puberty that uh, is in accordance to their sex assigned at birth. So um, things that will delay breast development, facial hair growth, um, you know, changes in a per an individual's voice, uh, menstruation, et cetera. And those are often given to youth who are under age 10. Uh, those can be pretty controversial in a lot of different kind of settings. Um, a lot of concerns will come up around hormone blockers in terms of, you know, is this a phase? How is this going to impact the young person later in life? All really valid concerns. I will say, though, that studies have pretty consistently shown that hormone blockers are associated with positive outcomes. Um, longitudinal studies have been done where youth have been followed up with at various time points for several years after um, receiving hormone blocker therapies and were found to have experienced significant decreases in their gender dysphoria and improved mental health, um, including significant reductions in symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, however, it can be really important to talk with youth about the impact that hormones can have on them and having realistic expectations about that. So, Gender hormone therapy can often take longer than youth expect it to. Um, youth who are experiencing dysphoria may have unrealistic expectations about what hormone therapy is going to do in terms of amelioration of that dysphoria. Um, in addition to hormone blocker therapy, there's also cross-sex hormone therapy. So uh, kind of past the age of puberty, after an individual has already undergone puberty, um, we will talk about 
uh, hormone therapy that um, is cross-sex. So for individuals who are born male at birth and identify as female, that will include estrogen. Uh, and for individuals who are born female at birth and identify as male, that will include testosterone. Also can be really important to talk about the impact that hormones will have on individuals in terms of that same idea about realistic expectations, what it will and won't do for an individual physically, as well as the way that hormone therapy can lead to um, some feelings of kind of motion, emotional ability, um, you know, feeling like a person is more tearful than they are used to being, um, experiencing some surges of anger that they may not be used to. Um, also some side effects, you know, things like um, acne growth, um, uh, acne and hair growth and, you know, in different places, et cetera. Um, while studies have consistently shown that there are largely positive outcomes associated with hormone therapy, um, there are some long-term consequences. So there are uh, some studies that have shown some possible increased cancer risk um, for individuals who have undergone hormone therapy, um, as well as I had one that I had mentioned earlier, which is infertility. So that can be something that's difficult, especially for young people to consider uh, when they are really eager to get started in terms of congruence, gender congruence um, measures. However, um, to the best of their ability and kind of uh, the clinician's ability, really important to consider those long-term um, potential impacts. So some possible areas of focus in terms of work with trans and gender nonconforming individuals. I mentioned self-advocacy. So working on um, identifying what a person's needs are in different social spaces, social relationships, whether that's you know, with families, in the workplace, in school, et cetera, um, how to navigate those public spaces. Um, in terms of maintaining safety, that can often be a really big one. Also allowing individuals kind of the, um, the ability to process that this is, can be anxiety provoking work and that, <coughs> excuse me, that they may not always be comfortable uh, expressing their gender in a way that affirms their gender identity. So sometimes it's, it's just hard and may not be worth it for a person, which can lead to some feelings of kind of inauthenticity um, and some grief in young people especially. So kind of helping them to navigate that. What do they want their interactions to look like? What do they want their gender expression to look like in different spaces? Um, often can include some trauma work. So whether that be related to bullying, um, being alienated within family spaces, losing employment, kind of all of those other areas of focus that we talked about, individuals often will need to really process the impact of that moving forward. Uh, case management and resource support really closely tied to interdisciplinary collaboration. So uh, often that will include working with an individual's primary care physician as well as advocates in the school setting, endocrinology specialists, et cetera. Um, identifying peer support, peer support excuse me, can also be really important for trans and gender nonconforming individuals. So the ability to see themselves and their identities reflected in people around them for individuals that are primarily used to existing and kind of moving in primarily cisgender spaces can be really significant in terms of helping mental health symptoms, uh, depression, anxiety, dysphoria, et cetera. Um, so people need to see others that look like them and who've had similar experiences. I included several resources here in a lot of different areas. Um, feel free to check out any of these links. Um, as we mentioned, these slides will be available. Uh, also here, some recommended viewing. So there are two individuals that I often recommend uh, that folks listen to discuss their own gender, and those are Jacob Tobia and Alok Vade Menon, and there are links to both of them discussing kind of their experience of their own gender identity and their gender development process. Um, I think it is really important to listen to folks who exist in these identities and with some of these realities of uh, considerations that I have discussed here today. So people who are experiencing those things firsthand on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Um, I think that that is probably all that I have to share with you for today. I'm so certainly happy now to take any questions that anyone may have. Um, okay, so one question was, any suggestions on how to work with uh, adolescents with transitioning parents? Uh, that is a great question. Wondering if uh, you can provide any information, any kind of additional information on what you might be looking for there. Um, However, I think that a lot of similar concepts to what I discussed in terms of working with parents of transitioning youth can look like. So helping uh, youth to adolescents to explore their own feelings about their parents' identity um, in terms of shame. Um, often lots of feelings of pride and support can also come in place here. Um, helping kids to navigate social relationships. So how are they going to discuss their parents' gender identity and gender expression with peers, um, with other family members, with people in the community? How will they respond to potentially um, negative responses from people in the community. Um, I think all of those things can be really important. Uh, one of the things I think that is often important for adolescents is having some scripts around this. So preparing for these situations, uh, helping them to identify some things that they would feel comfortable actually saying in the moment, as well as practicing saying some of those things. Um, some grief loss work can also really come into play here. So a, a youth kind of loss of their parent as they know it, what their relationship will look like, and then helping both the youth and the parent to identify the things that they're going to need in terms of interacting, from e interacting with each other. So what kind of education is the youth going to need? Um, what does the youth need from their parent in terms of just kind of patience and um, gentleness around adjusting to different names, pronouns, et cetera? Um, let's see, can you discuss the impact of hormone treatment on clinical high-risk symptoms? Um, that is a great question. I am not an expert in hormone treatment, so what I can actually do is link some additional resources. I can send them to Vanessa um, and uh, we'll specifically look for some information on that question. But again, don't necessarily feel well-versed enough to discuss that personally. Um, oh yes, uh, Vanessa mentioned that those can be added with slides on the website. Thank you. Um, another question, when you mentioned inner turmoil from gender dysphoria, what are some clinical interventions that would help them resolve or make peace with this? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, that can be one really significant area of um, clinical work that is difficult for clinicians and for clients themselves um, sometimes to figure out what they're going to need. So when I work with clients that are experiencing gender dysphoria, we talk a lot about what the person's uh, gender kind of binary framework is. So what are their own beliefs about gender? And uh, you know, what do they believe their gender represents? Um, what are they wanting to move toward? So in um, working with, <coughs> excuse me, working with folks who are pursuing um, gender congruence measures, what do they want themselves to look like and their relationships to be like? Um, are they have, do they have fears about 
how those changes are going to impact them. Um, I think a lot of the work is around really helping the person to identify what the root of the dysphoria is. Um, you know, again, expectations, feeling guilt, shame, things like that, embarrassment, a lot of anxiety around social relationships and interactions, certainly something um, that I see manifest in a lot of individuals that experience dysphoria. So working around the social anxiety piece. Again, I think scripting can be really important here. So helping the person come up with a narrative that they're comfortable sharing about their gender identity and expression. Um, we do a lot of mindfulness work, um, a lot of kind of basic CBT. So working on what the person's automatic thought process is when they often are you know, looking in the mirror, um, showering, uh, situations that can really induce feelings of dysphoria. So I worked with a client who uh, had a lot of dysphoria specifically around um, the broadness of her shoulders and hairline because those were things that she perceived as being almost hyper-masculine, and so they really induced a lot of kind of distress and dysphoria with the person. Um, so we talked a lot about what the automatic thought process was like there, what kind of belief and value system the person was associating with those thoughts, and then just practicing doing some thought stopping and some, um, you know, just kind of interrupting that automatic thought process. A lot of examining, you know, is this actually true? Um, you know, what behaviors are being associated with these thoughts and these beliefs, and are they in some ways then reinforcing feelings of dysphoria? Um, any good resources for working with Hawaiian or other Asian populations? Um, can, again, a, a little bit more kind of information about what you mean by that question I think would be helpful. Um, I'm not sure if you mean in terms of, you know, particular cultural or familial expectations. Um, that's something that I also would uh, have some information that I can include in uh, uh, additional slides afterwards. One other thing, excuse me, to talk about gender dysphoria um, intervention-wise, this is definitely a place that I recommend peer support. Um, I think that hearing about other uh, young people's experiences with gender dysphoria and things that they have done that have been helpful for them, but also, again, just to be able to see one's identity reflected in youth around you for youth that exist in a lot of cisgender spaces can really be helpful uh, in terms of discre decreasing dysphoria, um, which certainly is often, you know, related to one's expectations um, and, you know, feelings about being other, atypical, ostracized, et cetera. Uh, okay, so the additional question about Hawaiian or other Asian populations, um, if they have their own cultural models on gender, what's the best way to interact with them? Um, so I think that, it, you know, it's really important to first come from a good understanding of what a population's model on gender is. Um, I don't know that anything specifically about trans and gender non-binary identities changes in terms of you know, what the work would look like, but first understanding the framework that clients are coming from is, is really, really important. Um, I also think that it can be helpful to share with families that um, there are other uh, cultures that have, are more and have long been accepting of trans and non-binary folks. Um, Often people have heard in the Native American community, um, there's a term called two-spirit, which is related to, uh, you know, gender expansive identities and kind of existing outside of the, um, the gender binary. There are also, there's another Asian population um, that has a specific, I, the term is escaping me at this point, but that uh, has a specific term also for individuals who are non-binary um, and really reflects increased comfort with, you know, androgynous presentations and identities that are outside that binary again. But also happy to see if I have any additional resources specifically on the uh, Asian population or Hawaiian population um, that I can send along. Any other questions? We have about one minute left. Uh, 
the question is, what is the etiquette when the need for pronoun use arises of someone you just met or have social interaction with? I have heard mixed messages about whether one should ask or not. Yeah, that's also a really great, great question. Um, I think the reality is there are different schools of thought around this. Um, you know, there are some folks who do feel like asking someone's pronouns puts them in a situation to have to out themselves that they may not be comfortable with. Um, I tend to be in the camp that feels like um, if I have a question about a person's pronoun, I am likely to ask them outright, but more likely to actually start by identifying my own pronouns. Um, I think that that can be helpful in a way that um, can often I, you know, show people that you're not thinking that being um, cisgender is sort of the, the norm in a way that, you know, there's something about the question about what are your pronouns that implies um, that you are re recognizing that the person may be trans or non-binary uh, and they may be sort of other. So starting by saying, you know, hi, I'm Megan, my pronouns are she, her, um, you know, what's your name? And the person often then will also fill in their pronouns. But again, just being sure to operate in a way that reflects a, a lack of kind of that cis-normative language that we talked about. But I always think asking um, is, is better than assuming. Anything else? All right, thank you all so much. Um, please let me know if you have any additional questions. Um, Vanessa certainly has my contact information and can be in touch.